Hey everyone, how you doing? As you can probably see, I'm at Red Team Alliance right now because we have another covert entry class starting this next week, so I'm one of the primaries on that. And I should be asleep right now since all the students are arriving tomorrow morning, but I care about you, so you got a video coming out. It is an older one. This is a talk I gave at B-Side Seattle during the pandemic with kind of no slides, no prep, no fucks. It was something I could only do, frankly, from home. It was showing people what is in my and my team's field cases. Because on jobs, you know, we got these Pelican cases that come with us. They got all kinds of gear from social engineering to field tools to penetration rigs. And yeah, I'm not gonna fly to a conference with everything I fly with to jobs. So hope you enjoy it. If you didn't catch it on their channel, which judging from the views, not a lot of you did, I am cross posting it here. So a peek inside the Pelicans coming to you. Stay safe out there. <laughs> We're all doing our best during the pandemic, aren't we? Um, yeah, my wife is way better at presenting from home than I am, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you all will enjoy this at least a little bit. This talk is gonna be kind of different for me. Most of the time, I am showing you a ton of slides, right? Most of the time I have a bunch of artwork and videos and it's just very polished. This is a talk with zero slides. This is a talk exclusively about showing you hardware. So I figured unlike most, most times at cons when I can't travel with as much as I travel with on jobs, I am literally home like all of you. I am literally home and I have a bunch of cases with me. So let's go ahead and do this, right? This is the peak inside the Pelicans. And when, if those of you don't know, uh, I am, for, yeah, I don't know if we did intros, right? I am Devian Olaf. I have been around many of, many of these events. Oh, we even have a live audience clap, <laughs> awesome. Yes, I do a lot of physical side security work. I do physical penetration. I run a covert entry team. I am a safe technician and safe cracker. I would love to answer any questions you may have about physical security around your facilities. But this talk is about showing you how we exploit that physical security. So when we are on jobs, when my team deploys somewhere, we get set up, we usually rent an Airbnb, everyone just starts bringing in cases of equipment, either hard dig cases or you know storm cases. In my case, I'm a big fan of Pelican gear. So right now in my house, I have an array of stuff. Some of it would be at other offices, some of we other team members. My stuff comes in three main cases. We have a case called penetration, a case called field gear, and a case called social engineering. So I'm not sure how long this will take. We're gonna freeform it a little bit and go through just a list of everything. And please, for anyone who wants to, ask questions the entire time. We have a, we have a lovely volunteer person who will take a look at your talking as you're typing, and we'll go from there. So starting off, we open this case up and some of you can see there, there are things that look like large wires. What are they? Well, any one of you who have done a lot of hardware work in the field, you can recognize, right? Under door tools. For anyone who does not follow Not So Civil Engineer on YouTube, you're doing it wrong. You should follow him. So Not So Civil Engineer had some really cool mods to the under door tool, not least of which is the use of a retractable cord, right? This is a device called a keyback. It is used for, well, janitors and the like who need to always be reaching for their keys. This is their big heavy duty one. It comes with a very, very long Kevlar style cord. And anything you can do to kind of police up and manage that under door tools cord, especially in the field is a really good thing. You can kind of also see that on other tools we have made, we just have that cord kind of, you know, wound up and bunched up. Now that's great when it's in storage, but when you actually deploy it and you're in the field, you're wrapping up on yourself, you're getting all caught and tied. This, holy crap, is this the way to freaking go with under door tools. More tools. We've got a Klein tools bag here. We've got a zipper bag. Let's just start pulling out bags. I am a big proponent of containerization inside of things, right? All right, let's see. Let's, let's take this small one that's the heaviest one of all. Why the hell does it weigh so much? Why, it's because a lot of brass is in here. This is key impressioning. So you've got a ton of blanks. We've got some impressioning handles. This is what you've got if you need to try to either try to find a master key, try to work a lock. If you're not familiar with what impressioning is, ask over in the lock picking chat. 
I see a number of familiar names who are running that for this con. But impressioning is an attack that does involve blank keys. And you've got to have the right blank key for every lock. So we travel with a ton of them. Many of them are going to be Schlage, because frankly, you run into a ton of Schlage equipment in commercial spaces, right? This feels really light. It feels incredibly light, but I can tell you it contains more keys. What does it contain? This is called a heavy equipment key set. Many times when you have large construction equipment, cranes, you name it, this kind of gear, it doesn't, they don't all have unique keys. If you've seen Howard Payne and I give a presentation about key to like equipment, this is the case for tons and tons of heavy, and we have, we just have lists of which, you know, this is a guide. If you have a crane, if you have a, you know, a scissor lift, we've absolutely borrowed a scissor lift one time to get kind of up into a ceiling area. We didn't have to hunt for the key, we had the key. If you're looking online for this though, you wanna search for Tornado, by the way. Tornado is who makes this quote, heavy equipment key set. Klein tools bag. Why is it the lineman's bag? Well, this is a lot of just hand tools and the like, right? A lot of manual tools. Little power driver. I did a video review about liking to like have, you know, enjoying having an actual power driver when I'm popping card readers off the wall and such. If you watch lock picking lawyer, holy crap, dude, the nut buster, the nut splitter. You can shear apart. I'm not saying we always like to go with this kinetic, right? But if you have a you know heavy pair of pliers or a Saskatchewan nut rounder that you can crescent wrench on the end of this. Absolutely, we have chunked chains apart. We have broken shackles apart when the client has wanted us to go destructive. Or pliers. Again, this is this is just kind of brutal hand tools, kind of sloppy police type entry tools in hotel rooms. If you're not familiar with what a lock jockey is, many many police and first responders trying to get into hotel rooms are going to use a couple of tools like a slim jim and a lock jockey to pop those night latches apart wire and cord you can never have enough wire and cord uh, in fact so much so that there's even you know a giant spool of paracord here in the pelican case right bits and other assorted cutty things so manual hand tools this is fun. This is like I get to do an inventory of my own stuff and see how much I've been keeping around that I do or don't use anymore. Perhaps the funniest hand tool of all, and you'll see these appear elsewhere as well. Long, like old person retiree grabbers, right? Like just because a security camera or some sensor is a little bit out of reach, you don't have to do the whole ladder routine. Like, oh, I'm gonna walk in with a ladder. We have definitely gotten in places looking like we belong there with a ladder, but have like, this was a Walmart special. This was a $4 Walmart special. And I used it to actually just change the direction of a camera that was facing down on a badge reader that we wanted to mess with. Nobody came out after I changed the direction on the camera. We left it for two or three days. Someone else went up there, worked all they wanted to work. More bags. A little bit more on the precision side of tools. This is the bag of stuff that I don't drop and kick around very hard. We do have a digital caliper for some key measurements. We have some spare parts for what is known as a pack-a-punch. We have some spare parts for the electronics side of the house. If we're working with our ESP keys, this is, oh, this is really nice. This was a gift from someone at LockCon I'm going to say this must have been seven years ago that somebody made this. This is a little, you know, a little flashlight, right? Somebody, th it might have been either Bobic who did this. Maybe, maybe Holly remembers. Uh, she she might have been there. So this is a filament, just, you know, fiber optic style filament, right? This is a 3D printed tip that clicks over the end of this tiny pocket flashlight. And now we actually have ourselves an itsy bitsy fiber optic light. Useful for looking deep down inside of keyways, trying to count pins, trying to see if you've screwed something up and knocked a master pin out of alignment because you were picking or manipulating a master keyed system and shouldn't have been doing that. Not like I would ever be speaking from experience there and accidentally knocked a master pin out of where it shouldn't have been. So yeah, more sensitive tools and equipment spare parts and uh, electronics to beat the band. Another punch down tool for our ESP keys. More ESP keys are down here. 
So yeah, this is kind of the more small sensitive equipment. And we're still in Pelican case number one of three. I hope this is uh, valuable thus far. What else is coming on? Aha, <laughs> the white bag that should have a giant warning label on it. This is the dangerous magnet bag. In fact, you can even see things inside of it are, are packed inside of other boxes designed to give space in between ugh, different boxes. So just space upon space upon space. This is a magnet with, well, I don't want to imagine the, the pull strength of this magnet, but I do know that because of the inverse square law, if we keep it inside of enough containers, it won't absolutely kill people when they're near it. This magnet is even more heavy duty. And let's see, this one's still in its professional packaging. Let me keep it away from all the other magnets. Yeah, if you are transporting magnets, definitely honeycomb that stuff up with the packaging that it came with so that you're not going through some kind of, you know, not just lifting your, your stuff out of your bag and all of a sudden your hammers and your vice grips and everything else are just attached to this block that you're never, never going to free it from ever again in the future. Why would I have heavy duty magnets in this case? Well, if you're familiar with bypassing sensors, bypassing alarm sensors, or even the attack against the uh, simplex lock made by Kaba. If you're familiar with the Kaba 1000 series, uh, the Magneto attack, in fact, Sparrow's tools, Sparrow sells a, a device they call the Magneto, definitely still works occasionally in the field. That lock has been revised over the years, right? It was only early versions of the Kaba 1000 that worked. Uh, but if you can get it to work, awesome, do it, right? But if you're transporting your magnet around, I don't know how Sparrow ships the Magneto, but put, put a lot of buffer space around it. What else we got in here? We got a nice big zipper case, right? What could this possibly be? These are the elevator keys. Elevator keys of the whole collection. Again, if you haven't seen the talk that Howard Payne and I gave years ago about elevator hacking, this is my full key collection. Uh, yes, it has been used many, many times in the field. No, you shouldn't use elevator keys in the field if you don't know what you're doing. And we even have a module in our training classes, right? When we talk to people, where we show people elevator attacks, we show people how elevator systems work. And our whole, we really wanna ram it through people's heads though, students who wanna learn this from us. We say, look, you don't have to put an elevator onto other modes of operation to demonstrate impact for the client. If you have a key and you're like, all right, this is a ThyssenKrupp elevator. I've got the L206 key, I've got the L203 key. Couple of things you can do with a client. You can walk a client into the elevator to say, I would like you to document. You could, you could take a picture if you're on a physical job. You take a picture of yourself literally in the elevator holding the key. That is proof that you had the key in that elevator. If the client really wants to know, like, well, how do I know? You understand, right? You can turn a key without turning a key. You can turn the key slightly and demonstrate to the client, look, th this key is turning. This is the right key. I'm not going to turn it all the way. And the client, if they really, they really put you like, you're like, I mean, you can turn the key. It's your freaking building, boss. <laughs> but you don't have to actually mess with elevators in order to demonstrate them as a vulnerability. So when we say we have all these keys, being able to just verify with the client, we could do this. This is feasible. This is the working key. That's what happens in many instances, and it covers your butt. Speaking also of cover your butt and talk to your lawyers, spy cables. For those who aren't familiar, these are audio and GPS tracker cables. These are eavesdropping cables. There are many, many like them. They are, I have, I have a few more that are actually in another job case because they all used to be in here. But yeah, this is not just a regular phone charging cable. If you take this little sleeve off, you know, this will accept a SIM card. This is a bug, this is, this is a bug cable. Uh, now, when we do our proper professional surveillance class, we have much, much better gear and equipment. Not just sort of, you know, this is literally an Amazon special. But again, I had to demonstrate once to a client, uh, the law office said, well, what could happen if someone got in here? I didn't even plug this in. I just swapped it with a cable that was sitting in a law office that was our client. And I said, okay, so see that cable in a drawer? And they said, yeah. I said, take it out. That's not the cable that was there. And they opened it and they freaked out. Didn't even have a SIM card in it. So it's not like it was a real bug, but being able to show them, oh, someone could do that to you 
that was an incredible value add. Why did I mention lawyers first though? Because eavesdropping, understand your laws, understand one party consent, understand all party consent, what state and territory you're operating in. Don't screw around with eavesdropping if you don't know what you're doing. We got another bag. What's in this case? This is possibly, this is gonna be a cautionary tale. And you'll see this comes, this is a, this is a callback joke later. This is an itsy bitsy battery powered Dremel. The, the Dremel hand tool line of products, you know, many times you've got to fabric cobble a new tool. Is this battery even, <laughs> yeah. The reason this doesn't matter to me and I could probably just throw it out. I bought this on a job when I was trying to manufacture an under door tool in a hotel room. And I said, well, if I'm going to buy a Dremel, I might as well get the Dremel that I can, you know, have on the job. I can have a job, you know, I can be, what if I get the Dremel and I want it in the field? Maybe I have to fix this tool. I should get the battery powered one and keep it in my field bag, my field bag that we'll go through in a minute. This is without a doubt the worst product ever. If you're ever getting like that little screwdriver, great. Screwdrivers, low power, short usage. Dremel and rotary cutting tools, much more of a long duty cycle. You're gonna put a lot more energy into that tool. The battery tools conk out all the time and they're off. Like this can fuck right off. That is not a tool I want in the field, frankly, anymore. I'm glad, this is, I'm glad we're, we're doing this. Couple more things to get through. Speaking of the spy cables, right? Also in spy territory. We've talked about it in class. This is a USB bore scope. This is something that we can, you know, slip through a door. So we've actually slipped this inside of a safe before uh, because safes have mounting holes, right? USB is nice because not only modern phones, right? You don't have to just plug into a laptop. If you have an Android device that supports what's called OTG or on the go mode, making your port a master port, you can actually control a USB device. I can look on my phone and I can see what this camera is seeing. So I'll be able to, we usually use these to slip under doors. If we're looking to do an under door attack, we're trying to see where the door handle is. Having a little bore scope with you sometimes comes into play and is useful. No, we're not doing the sort of hostage rescue team thing where you slip it through an air vent and then you, you know, you're monitoring how many people are still in the room and get the patterns and, oh, the guard's coming, now the guard's going. Oh, no, we're not that badass. And another bag of electronic spare parts, jumper wires, a lot of, you know, jumper bridge cables, usable sometimes for elevator demos. If we're talking about what someone could do in a controller, I wouldn't touch that. Howard Payne could, although frankly, he wouldn't touch that either because you don't mess with the controller. A lot of times the extra wires I have are just for bridging contacts inside of access control cabinets. It's one of those funny things too, like just literally it's a bit of wire. Let me go ahead and just pull one out, right? This is nothing but a bare chunk of freaking wire. Finding wire when you wish you had wire is ridiculous. It's one of, we're all electronics and technical people, right? Like just finding a spare bit of wire. I've been on jobs where someone had to go and find a phone and I just pulled a piece of silver satin that was, you know, plugging a convenience phone into a wall. I was like, well, I hope they don't need that phone right there in the cafeteria for a minute because I need this wire. And I was ripping wires out of this piece of, you know, this little Cat 3 wire. That's ridiculous. So always have a couple of spare wires on you. You never know when you're going to need to jump a contact if you're doing electronic shorting out. Another bag. I'm going to admit, I haven't opened this in a while. I don't even know what's in this bag. Let's have a look. Oh, -ho! all right. I know why I haven't opened this in a while. This is my, I don't use it much anymore, but I'm not gonna throw it out bag. So sort of like old bump keys. We, we have a multi-lock interactive drilled as a bump key. We have a tree of ink in case I do, you know, a bunch of, bunch of work in Norway, I could bump a lock in Norway, I guess. So obscure bump keys. We have an arrow bump key in here. We have, okay, a Yale depth key. These are keys, again, that I've cut on jobs. They're useful, I don't use. Screwdriver, well, I have the, the power screwdriver now. I don't always have the manual screwdriver. I also have a much better manual screwdriver. For those who have seen my solve a lot of problems kit bag. Vera, oh my God, Vera tools with not only conventional bits, but tamper style bits. The thing that's amazing about Vera, the German company, all of their bits have the little hollow in the middle if you come across 
torques, if you come across a hex, they have the tamper already carved out. So approaching something like a tamper installed or a resistant card reader, access control box, a panel, this is your kit. Uh, I don't work for Vera, very nice German company manufactured in the Czech Republic now. I just love their gear. Also in the tools that I don't use a lot but haven't gotten rid of. <laughs> if you haven't seen a talk that I've given before about copying keys from clay molds, this is a cast and mold kit. This is polymer heat set clay. This is a Burns torch a little Civil War reenactment, melt your lead shot kind of cup. Yeah, this is a kit where you actually can take a mold, a clay mold impression of a key that you come across, leave the key exactly where you found it, put it back, and then later on, using low melting point metal, we actually use Woods metal and Fields metal. Frankly, this is just Woods metal because it's cheaper. Just don't, you know, don't touch your face. It's like COVID, but with lead poisoning. Uh, yeah, we, we will make copies of keys. Uh, if you've never seen how to do that, I have a talk online about that. Copying keys from photos, molds, and more. Little release agent powder. Don't forget to use the powder when you are, this is, no, it's not cocaine to keep yourself going on those long stakeout nights. No, that is for copying keys from clay molds. So right on. Uh, have I used that in the last year? No. Did I like it whenever I've gotten to use it in the field? Yes, that's why this still sticks with me. One more from the, here, let's, from the department of old, right? How many people in the audience know what this is? Not what's in it, just this case. The 80s are back, baby. Maybe even the 90s. You know what this is? This is a case for CDs. <laughs> Remember, you'd have one of these like in your car with all the mix, the hot summer mix 98 that you made on your 4X CDR burner. Uh, and I think it's appropriate that this case logic case from Best Buy is, is here and how old it is, because what we have in it is something equally old. We have tubular lock related tools. So this is a tubular pick set, this is a tubular key cutter. Uh, we have tubular depth gauges. If you're not familiar, you're totally tubular keys, man. Uh, tubular keys, right? They are not as common anymore as they once were very, very prominent in the field. But if you do encounter a tubular key system, it's not like, you know, we travel with key machines. We travel with hand punch key machines. We travel with a HPC Blitz. It's not like you're gonna make a tubular key on most punch machines. This is a manual grinding style tubular key maker. Bad ass. I, I think that is just an absolute hoop. So before we put away the penetration case, what is in the actual bag, the bag that is typically thrown over someone's shoulder unless they're trying to be super low profile? This doesn't look quite like a, a tech company bag, right? If we have just a messenger bag or maybe something, who is a Peak Design? Peak Design makes the bag that Bobak really likes, and he puts a lot of gear in his Peak Design bag because it looks very Silicon Valley. Uh, but this bag right here, let's let's look inside the the penetration bag that is kind of slung over a shoulder. And it's always a little different each time. It always depends on what kind of job I was just on. But here we go. All right. Quick access. What do you think is in the quick access? It's the bypass tools and such. If you have not ever seen some of this. All right. We've got some super easy to use field key. These are various server cabinet keys that are incredibly common. I also have a Verizon cabinet key that you see will occasionally open Verizon field gear. I have to do a job as a Verizon tech. We'll show you the shirt later. So that's a quick access kind of at the top. What's in here? One of my favorite tools ever, right? We've got the traveler hook, bypassing those door latches. Use it constantly right in the top of the bag. Pre-cut but unfolded padlock shims. I have definitely shimmed some padlocks in the field when necessary. Give them a try. Why it's a cheap attack, you can try it before you, that's for perimeter gates and the like. And yeah, the if you're not familiar with the hammerless hinge pin tools, these hammerless punch tools, uh, Lockpicking Lawyer featured them on his channel when we showed them to him at Red Team Alliance at our headquarters in Virginia. If you're not familiar with that, maybe I'll, I'll throw up some links, I'll throw up some, some things like that later on. 
so you can take a look uh, at all the like the various attacks and other talks I'm referencing. I'll try, I'll rewatch this recording. I'll put a whole bunch of notes together. Someone will throw it on a video somewhere. Or I'm recording this too. So if the video eventually is not up, if the stream didn't record, I'll throw it up. One way or another, going to give you some information. Back to the bag. We've got some more exterior pockets. What's on this front pocket? Anything much? Yes. <laughs> Anybody who works in the culinary industry, if you've ever deboned a bunch of fish, do you know what these are? These are anti cut gloves. They do not prevent stabbing, right? You don't, you don't want, don't want to do this, but you can do this all day long. This is just me slashing at my hands here. If you are trying to scale a fence, if you are trying to get past razor wire, you can get it kind of out of your way with gloves like this and work your way around it. Remember though, only works for the slashing parts, not the poking bits. So don't learn that the hard way. Also, Helpful around bushes, brambles, uh, things of that nature. Moving on. Next pouch. In the front. What's in the front? Anybody? We were talking literally about this on Twitter. Vera Six Shooter. Bits in the handle, including a punch down bit for knocking in the uh, ESP key tools, right? This is my absolute goddamn favorite personal screwdriver. Uh, you can, again, switch the heads out. It's quick load, quick release bits. This, this is the tool, man, to have in your back pocket on a penetration job. Bigger pouch here. What's going on here? Let's start pulling stuff out. Oh, all the lockpickers in the room just got envious. They're like, how in the hell did you get a Sparrow's, you know, the disc pick? Uh, well, because somebody in the tool chat was really kind and said, hey, do you guys know Sparrows is selling some more of those impossible to find kit picks? So I bought one. Uh, I will look in the tool slack and thank whoever that was later. More tamper bits, again, because I don't have my full suite of tamper bits here. I have tamper torques on here. Tiny screwdrivers, a little thumb turn flipper, if you're not familiar. Kind of a whoop. Whew. You ever see one of those? You reach through the door. Sometimes firemen will call these a J-tool. You can absolutely operate locks from the other side of the door. Oh, somebody stuck to, all right. Gee, what, what could be in here? Like, pull that off of there. Well, we have more, you know, tamper bits and the like, because occasionally you'll come into odd fasteners. But definitely another magnet in here, Just bypassing those sensors as needed. A couple of wires for shorting out wires. Some jigglers and other, you know, bump keys and the like that I've occasionally used. I use them less now, but I will have a jiggler set or two on me. What are you jiggling? You're mostly jiggling something like filing cabinet, which you can open with a regular pick set. And I would have my pick set on me separately. Plug spinner, one of those things you will hate life if you wish you had a plug spinner and you don't have it in your bag. So I just finally started keeping the plug spinner around. Somebody's down in the front here. Oh, I think I know what these are. These are probably going to be assorted bypass tools. Let's see, yes, we have an Adams Wright bypass wire. Oh, we have a second Adams Wright bypass wire because they break so easily. Is this going to be the American lock? Yes, and we have an American lock bypass driver. If you are curious what bypass driver tools do, uh, you could try to ask in the lockpick village. We don't always, it depends, every lockpick village is a little different where you draw the line between lock picking and lock sport and bypassing. Uh, bypassing isn't really a lock sport kind of endeavor, so you won't always get a lot of discussion about tools like that. But if you're curious about them, hit me up online if someone needs to tell you about them. I can explain them a bit. What is this? Is this a magic marker? No, this is the world's absolute worst pair of scissors. So terrible that you will not wish you bought them if you buy them. But they are really nondescript, right? They they will slip past even sometimes through a magnetometer. And if I can't have my multi-tool or other blades, which I do have on the outside of my bag, not bad to have a pair of scissors around. Little electronic guy right here. What is it? This is known as a search pole. This is a magnetic tool that will actually orient a, and look for magnetic fields. You can even see this little magnet is pivoting and swinging through this field. 
You can use this to find magnetic sensors in door frames and window frames and window sills. Uh, we use this for bypassing, you know, doors that we need to jump out the magnets on. We need to, we need to get around that. Anything much more buried in here? Huh. Super old timey bump hammer. I don't bump a lot of locks open, but when I do, I definitely use a homebrew hammer that uh, was not commercial in any way. Pouch on the outside, possibly going to have my multi-tool in it, unless, no, my multi-tool is missing because I was using it on a different, uh, I was using it in the garage or something like that. Anybody going on over here? Oh, what are you? Literally folded pieces of plastic. These we have, this is, what is this? Can anyone tell? Yeah, that's a hotel room key. And it's folded and has a small piece of tape. And what is on that piece of tape? That piece of tape has a magnet on it because this was a piece of tape with the magnet and we slipped it into a door to bypass a door sensor. That's what all of this is. This is tape and magnets and folded bits of plastic. Amazing. And that's just about all except one last thing and I will mention it. It's not a bad thing to use and to have around. And I completely stole this from a hotel kitchen or something where I was breaking into someplace. Door stop. Having a crappy little door stop that you can just jam into a door that you don't want to close. And it also kind of looks like someone's working there if somebody props a door open. It's one of those things that someone doesn't want. Is that door supposed to be open? Is it not supposed to be open? Being able to just to shove that in so you can quickly come back as needed. It's totally something I have done in the past. So that just about does it for the first case, the penetration case, but we have a lot more here. How are we doing on time? We're doing great on time. You have 28 minutes left in the hour. That is going to be just about perfect. I don't know if we've had any uh, commentary from the audience yet or any further questions for what they've been seeing. They are doing great right now. I think we'd love to see All right. Pelican case number two. Let's grab the next Pelican case. Okay, let's see what we have. This is the case marked, this is the, this is the most boring one, I'll tell you. It's, this is just marked field gear. And you're like, well, wasn't that a bunch of field gear? No, that first Pelican case was marked penetration. Field gear is usually, in my mind, when you're kind of outside of the building. Let's look at a few important things, though, that are in here. Not the least of which, a much better freaking Dremel that plugs in. <laughs> Yeah, this is the one you want. Uh, you can tell that was the I'm frustrated and throwing out the old Dremel and buying this one kind of gear. These guys, though, what are the what are what the hell are these weird shapes? These are called fence climbers. The idea is you can absolutely pass this through a chain link fence and then let it hang down. And then now on both sides of the fence, you have treads. You can actually step all the way up. You can get up a 12 foot fence in almost no time, putting one at a time as you go and then pulling it out as you come back down. Fence climbers, not the easiest thing to find. Usually in law enforcement catalogs, Zach Tool used to make one, Z-A-K. Zach, I don't think they make these anymore. Uh, I don't know who, these aren't Zach's because there are four of them. Zach was a three set. I will try to look this up though. I'll try to find which crazy military catalog or I might have bought these from somebody whose business card I got at like SHOT Show. Uh, but yeah, I have totally used these. I've used these to scale fences. One more thing about scaling, oh yeah, another grabber arm. Quick deploy, this is the rapid deployment grab arm with a little weird safety interlock that you, there we go. Uh, scaling fences, there is literally a ladder in here. There is a, this is like one of those child safety, get out of the bedroom ladders. And we spread it out. We spray painted the whole damn thing black. We covered the treads with, uh, you know, like grip tape. These are little stoppers that go like on the bottom of canes or something. I don't know what, I think I cleaned out a drugstore. And I, cause I, cause normally it's just metal, right? And if you hang this on a fence or a wall, metal against the clang, clang, bang, clang, uh, I didn't want that. So I just covered the whole thing in black paint, matte black, and I put little rubber feet 
on all the treads. And we were what we did is we used there are super long extendable poles that you can get that you can use for changing light fixtures. Uh, we found those at like a hardware store, and we got these long extensible poles. We kind of attached it to the end and just fished all the way up a wall. Because remember, the top of those escape ladders are big hooks. So we got these hooks way up on top of the wall. We could see it was just a flat concrete wall. And someone who was, you know, with eyes remotely looking from a hill, they're like, oh, dude, yeah, you're super over that wall. Who's going to go for it? Climbed right up the freaking wall. There you go. And then we threw a different rope ladder on the other side. What is this? Is this, is this for soft landings on the other side? Or is this for I'm going to yoga practice as a, uh, you know, social engineering employee? No, I, I don't yoga. Laying down in the dirt with your eyes on a target on really cold evenings, just putting eyes on target. Dirt is colder than you think. Having a little foam mat like that is a lifesaver. Oh my God, on really cold kind of stakeout nights. Speaking of stakeout nights, I mean, yes, of course. Camo fabric, we have got a ton of camouflage gear. You'll see things elsewhere. Having various kinds of knee pads. If you are doing any sort of digging, tunneling, trenching, this is why this is called the field gear case, right? We are doing really filthy, horrible, beat yourself up kind of work. Uh, getting down into, oh, dude, this is one super props to, uh, I think Matt uh, pointed this out to me. I don't know if Matt's in the audience, right? I, he needed one. I was like, oh, shit, I don't have one of those tools. I should order one of those tools. Getting down into access tunnels. Simple. Look, look at this tool on this table here. Super simple tool. This is a manhole cover remover. Four or five dollars or something on Amazon, and I put a couple of little soft, uh, you know, rubber bits on the handle. But oh my God, being able to actually not just lift the manhole cover the right way, but to look like you belong there, right? Looking like you should do, you know, what you're doing is a big part of getting into spaces where you don't belong. So having that little hook tool definitely important to me. Hand warmers, not just when you're freezing on cold nights, but sometimes trying to set off thermal sensors on the inside of doors. Yes, that goes in the field. We wound up using them way more often in the field, just that way. I even have more of these little rubber feet. This must have been, a, I don't know how many rubber feet I bought, but I remember at one point on the job, we were setting them up and using them like little bowling pins in the Airbnb because we were like waiting for a call from a point of contact and we're, we just had uh, tons of eyes out on the target recording footage. And I remember rolling gaff tape and knocking these down in a game of, you know, 10 pins. Speaking of eyes on target, dash cams, dash cams or GoPros. If you want to get super expensive, we have a bunch of GoPros in the fleet. Having these mounted in vehicles, we have absolutely parked vehicles near a target. And just let a dash cam play. Just let footage roll as long as you can. Fill up that memory card. Understand how this thing will operate with or without power. Uh, we have been in rental cars where the cigarette lighter would be on if the car was on. Then you turn the car off and the cigarette lighter still had power. So we're like, cool, sweet, this dash cam will work. But then five minutes after that, it would cut off. And then five minutes after that, the dash cam would go off. And if we go out there every five hours and we're like, why is there only 15 minutes of freaking footage? What is going on? Test all that at HQ or at your Airbnb or wherever before you go out to the field. We wound up just using a you know, battery bank, like an anchor power supply. That worked better. Uh, but yeah, test that kind of stuff out, man. You run into things like this. What on earth is even in this case? I don't know what's in here, but it's, was I trying to protect it? Is it sensitive? Yeah, it is a little sensitive. Okay. You know what's in here? Again, you don't have to be freaking James Bond the spy with all of the expensive gear. These are these are Amazon specials, babe. These are USB, or in the case of this case, you know, I have a little C adapter for put it on my phone. But these are crappy little digital telescopes. And I have, you know, a tiny rinky dink tripod. Uh, whenever you're doing any kind of telescope work your hand is not steady. Your hand will always weeble wobble. Get even the crappiest tripod ever, put it up on some rocks, or, you know, I have a proper tripod in here. Uh, this is something that you can, again, you can capture proof of concept footage. You can show people, I was able to be on this hill at the edge of your property, getting footage and monitoring your security activities. Now, if you need really good footage that is not kind of potato filmed, we do, of course, 
educate many people on high-end camera equipment. We have a surveillance class at Red Team Alliance that is all about high-end, like we'll, we'll push a camera all the way out to a quarter mile and still read license plates. Uh, that's something that's like our, our man Drew. If you don't know who Drew is at Red Team Alliance, he shows up in some of our talks. Drew is our main camera guy. And if you ever are really interested in like pushing a camera to the limit, if you love photography and want to get even better at it, find out if Drew is running one of his camera courses because I have learned more from him than I ever thought I would. And now I can take artsy fartsy photos that are badass. That is the field gear though. Not the sexiest case, but it's the kind of thing that on those cold nights or in the long distances or you're covered in filth digging under a wall, it's good to have some of that there. Let's look at the last one and it's a fun case. Let's look at the social engineering case. Okay, who's in ready for this, right? Are we, are we still enjoying ourselves? We haven't gotten a lot of audience commentary. We had any questions as we've been going or anything like that? Actually, we have a wonderful comment from the audience. Uh, Drew Porter is amazing. He's funny as <laughs> hell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is, was that comment made by Drew Porter? I have no idea, but. That would be great though, if, if Drew is <laughs> Actually, in. Actually, it's Gary. <laughs> oh, shit, yeah, dude. Oh, right on, of course. Yeah, Gary and Justin, I think Gary and Justin are talking later today. Uh, so yes, don't don't miss that. So I think after me, I think DJ Omi is probably talking, uh, and then I think Gary and Justin are after that. So all, like beside Seattle, props to all the talent that they pull in. Uh, I am I am amazed every time whenever I get to stick my head in. Social engineering, what do we got here? Well, you know, it's the kind of stuff you'd expect. It is it is humorous. It is fun to watch. It is fun to see. And I'm just I'm here to fix the elevators and stuff right like i've got i've got my employee badge hanging from an otis lanyard and you know yeah i've got uh i got it what you got a problem with the thing yeah i gotta I've gotta make sure i can let me badge into that with my badge that doesn't work or maybe it does because i stole your credentials these are these are social engineering outfits yes i do plenty of elevator type work so if i want to be the elevator person or if i want to be the elevator person in cold weather uh how many of you would be surprised to learn that Otis Elevator, because they're moving people. Otis Elevator has a shop that is public facing. So if, if you wanna go ahead and get yourself some elevator gear, I didn't get it through any special industry connections. I just, you know, clicked with my mouse. Complete the outfit, complete the look, get some high vis going on. Not all high vis is created equal, right? Look at your target facility. Are they wearing yellow with orange? Are they wearing just yellow? Are they crazy old and only wearing orange, which is not common anymore, unless you're you know, hunting. Um, yellow has become the default high vis, but again, find out what, the, what are the crew, what is the crew wearing? Get the correct high vis if you wanna look like you're part of the crew that the employee has seen working in the area. Similarly, if you wanna look like you belong in the area, you don't just go out and buy a single helmet, like, oh, I got myself a helmet. No, you want to, let's, let's take a look at this on the close cam, right? You want that helmet to be beat the hell up, and you also want to just throw, you know, get some local sports team stickers, get some union stickers on there, get, get just any kind of crap you can with it. Just really, yeah, sell the, sell the story, right? Thank you. More outfits. What do we got in here? Let's see. Oh, that was a client. We're not going to show them, but we uh, we definitely had stolen something from a data center or two. Thankfully, it was overseas. You might not know. Uh, fire inspector, absolutely. Now, be careful with with representing authority. Right, all of you should know. You are not a police officer ever. You do not pretend to be law enforcement. You cannot be a sworn officer. You can let people think that you're somebody official. If you are just posture you say well i'm here to i'm inspecting a problem i heard there was a you know whatever you do not present fake credentials you do not claim to be law enforcement another tricky one not as likely to get you in hot water but be careful and that is representing yourself as a lawyer practicing law without a license is a thing i don't think anyone would really call it the practice of law if you said i'm delivering this subpoena but have you ever gotten like a subpoena or a blueback or anything from a lawyer 
No, you get that from a process server, from some guy in a flannel shirt whose whole job is to sit in their car and wait until the subject comes out of the building and then run up to them and be like, Mr. Smith, this is yours. So yeah, you don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be the, the fire chief. You can just be, oh, I'm from H&K Fire Service, right? You can be, oh, what's your internet in the area? Oh, I'm from Comcast. There you go. I'm here to, you know, walk. you don't have to get in a building. You can just walk around the building noticing all the stuff you're going to exploit later. Who's that guy walking around in the bushes? Well, I don't know. He's got a shirt on that says he's from Comcast. And he's, he's carrying a metal clipboard and he's got kind of, he's got a tool belt. All right. So that's that guy. He must be doing something. He's probably from Comcast. Have the right apparel, have, you know, a bunch of grody old like work boots. That, that pair of awful hunting boots that you're thinking about throwing out, keep them, put them in your bag. And the last thing I'll show, in addition to, again, just, you see Tara and I, all we have is like black clothes. But in the social engineering bag, yes, I've got some old flannels. Yes, I've got a Budweiser hat. Things of that nature. And when you really get down to it, this, is, this could be a whole separate talk. This is my last gem, and then we're going to do, uh, we're going to do Q&A. The last gem in the IDs, have as many kinds of lanyards and ribbons and colors as you possibly can, because at a distance, it's possible to look like you belong there just because, oh, well, that everyone there wears yellow. Okay, so get yourself the yellow lanyard. Oh, everyone there wears green. Get the green lanyard. Get something that looks vaguely like the right badge, and there you go. So there's a lot more we could talk about. There are other things. I'm not going to pull out my old man Gramps cane. Do we have any questions from the audience in the minute or two before we have to wrap up? This was, this was a hoot. I haven't done this in a while. Well, we have three questions from the audience, and you've got five, six, seven minutes to answer, and it's great. We've got the first one is this one, my favorite question ever. Mm -hmm. What is the must-have tool for someone just starting on lock bypassing? The must-have tool for lock bypassing is the traveler hook. Hands down, uh, traveler hook to exploit bad door latches, because that's an actual tool, right? Like, that's a tool that's you can't just pick up off the ground. Having a latch slipping with like a flexible piece of plastic, anyone can just source that. Get the traveler hook, it's small, it'll fit in your back pocket, always have it. What's next? All right, what's next? What is the best way to learn these skills and not get arrested, Justin and Gary style? I didn't ask this. <laughs> I think that's gonna be their talk, right? Their talk is going to be about what went wrong. And most of the things that went wrong for Justin and Gary were not things they were doing wrong. Um, there was a there was a great event that was called Awareness Con, and John Strand and his whole crew ran that, and it was all about talking about the right or wrong way to engage with the community and do pen testing and say you know how to how to build bridges. I was pretty happy with some of the talks that were given at Awareness Con. I think, and I I I know that Coal Fire had a lot to say on this front as well. I would also say big thanks to Coal Fire. There is the Protecting Ethical Hackers Initiative. That is something that they have started. It is a mailing list, a working group, and a lot of good research is being done there, an effort that's going to carry the industry hopefully very, very forward. Wonderful. We have, uh, well, I thought we had one last question. We've actually got two or three more. Mm -hmm. We've got another six minutes to go before the end of your talk. So cool. Uh, our question here is what is the strangest piece of gear or clothing you have ever used on a contract, and do you have it here? <laughs> oh, man, I probably do. So the strangest piece of gear or clothing that I've ever had on a contract. Uh, let's, well, here's kind of a fun one, right? This little orange blinky, this is, you know, plug it in the cigarette lighter, mount this onto the roof of your rental car that you have in whatever city. People always will think there's some kind of authority going on. If you're up again, you have the metal blinky, the little blinky, and you have that metal freaking clipboard. And maybe you've ran off a couple of business cards at the printer at the business center at your hotel, right? You instantly look like, and it doesn't have to be a business card of you. You can run off a business card for the office park. Like have a business card that says like, you know, Keith Kaufman, manager of such and such plaza, 
And you're just a guy, you're like, yeah, uh, you've got a clip to your thing here. And you're like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm supposed to meet this guy. Do you know who this is? And they're like, well, no, we, we're, we're part of Widgeco. We just rent this building. That must, but that's our management company. You're like, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to keep walking around, but I'm just supposed to be doing a survey for the lines and I'm servicing the cable because I'm with, you know, Verizon. Yeah, having that kind of like just this, this dumb thing is they saw you get out of a late model Chevy Lumina with this blinking on the roof. Like, well, he must be here doing something. That light's blinking. Speaking of crazy things that you do, how do you get your cases through the airport? Check bags. <laughs> I give a whole talk about flying with firearms. Any of this crap can check. The magnets are weird. Do you understand that many airport scanning materials, the, those are magnet based, not just, um, like a ferometer, right? It just a, a magnetometer uses magnetic fields, sympathetic fields to detect metal. Your magnets will go bananas in that. But also the ones that are essentially almost like MRI machines, the, the through, the, you know, the, uh, who the hell makes them? Uh, Rapiscan, right? Those machines, the, um, the, they, will, <laughs> they will get weird results on the screen with a heavy enough magnet in there because it bends the actual fields. It bends, you know, the, the, the EM fields. So you might get some questions. But all of this that you've seen and more is legal in airport check bags thus far. Speaking of legal, as a result of the coal fire incident, have you or your teams taken any extra precautions to minimize risk? And if so, what are they? Uh, yeah, are we taking more precautions to minimize risk? Well, I'm, I'm a third party contractor, you can see. So it's not my job. I don't really belong here. Yes, the, the true answer, though, to minimize risk um, we are always a little more cognizant now of the language in certain contracts. Uh, the talk about the ultimate, I never thought it could happen to me moment was when, and Justin and Gary will talk about this in their talk, the point of contact who was on the letter, literally there's more than one point of contact on those authorizing letters and the guy wasn't even there, like didn't answer his phone, just poofed in the wind. Uh, normally, the point of contacts on our letter are our direct point of contact on the job. So we're like, we're at this, we're like, hey man, we're gonna do that thing. All right, we're checking in with you. We're, we're like constantly talking. But on bigger jobs, government jobs, like they were on, you might have somebody with a bunch of juice who is the authorizing party, but that person has effed off to a conference in DC or they're in another time zone or another state. And not just, that's a crazy thing, but I would tell everyone, check in, during daytime hours, so you're not pissing people off, check in with those two numbers on that letter and say, hey, just verifying, are you the person? Are you there? You don't tell them you're like breaking in right now because maybe they're vested in you being caught, but have somebody get them on the phone from, you know, you can social engineer them. Be like, hello, this is Susie with what Verizon Wireless. Are you happy with your plan? Just make sure someone's answering that phone. So that's something I would definitely say, but talk, watch their talk later today. You'll get a lot more uh, data out of them and more advice, I'm sure. And last question, building on social engineering, we have a question or two now. Social engineering is incredibly difficult. Um, last question, how do you get started in learning all of this? How do you get started in social engineering is difficult. Yeah, it's so difficult that I gave me a limp. I gotta use my cane. Can you get the door open for me, please? Um, yes, how do you learn social engineering? Well, there are, frankly, very good trainers operating in this space. Uh, I know that someone who we have worked with and talks on, she talks on Twitter all the time, Jack Hyde is an amazing speaker who has talked about this. I know that Snow from Snowfensive has talked about social engineering. The entire human hacker crew, right? They run the SE Village. Wonderful showmanship in addition to education from that event. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of it just comes from do it, do it until you're comfortable with it. It's flight time, right? Uh, it's, it's weird to lie to people until lying to people is your job. And at that point, does it matter? Like you're just all like, and cause lie when there's no stakes, literally you're checking out of a store and they want your home phone number and zip code. D none of us want to give our real info, but don't decline. Just lie. Know someone's real info. Know the white house phone number, know the white house zip code. Just lie, lie all the time and get good at it when there's no stakes involved. Yeah. That's my advice. Lie constantly. <laughs> it will serve you well. I think that's about it. That was just about it there. I'll be in the Discord, but this was awesome. Thank you so much to B-Side Seattle. Thank you to Tara, my beautiful, lovely wife. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you. Watch the rest of the talks. This one will be online one way or another. Have a good night.